take our Bibles together tonight and turn to 1 Samuel, in chapter number 30. 1 Samuel, in chapter number 30 tonight. We're going to start with the first few verses of this portion of Scripture. We're not going to look at the whole chapter tonight. Uh, there's a lot going on in this story, and we're not going to see the conclusion of the story. I think probably uh, the rest of the story is familiar to most of us. And if it's not familiar to you, it's a great story to read the rest of it as you see God give uh, victory in the end of the story. But we're going to look at uh, a portion of the events of this chapter this evening. Now, as we look at this story, we're going to uh, come to that in a moment. But uh, in situations of life, sometimes you uh, go into certain situations of life and you think you've made a good choice. And you find out afterwards that you've made a mistake. And you've done the wrong thing and it's turned out that something has uh, turned out completely different than you'd hoped it would. Uh, sometimes you might be trying to accomplish one thing and end up with a completely different result. Say, for example, if you wanted to plant some flowers in your garden. How many of you, anybody planting flowers this time of year? I know some of you got some flowers going on, that's pretty nice. Uh, these flowers here that I'm showing you on the screen, they're, they're a plant called Nigella sativa um, that's uh, popular for several reasons, but uh, you probably don't have any of those in your garden. They're not usually used for garden flowers, but if you wanted to plant some Nigella sativa and you went to the, uh, went to the shed to find some seeds and, uh, and you saw these seeds, you'd think, oh yeah, those are the right seeds. That's what the seeds look like from that plant. It's also known as a black caraway plant. Uh, I guess the seeds are uh, useful for spices and things. Um, but you might have a problem if you grabbed these seeds that look very similar. <laughs> Do you know what those seeds are? Those are cactus seeds. <laughs> You'd get a very different outcome, wouldn't you? <laughs> you might make some choices in life where sometimes you think you've got it figured out and all of a sudden things blow up in your face. You might have laid some plans and uh, had some situations come together and all of a sudden uh, you ended up with instead of some black caraway or some nice purple or blue flowers, you end up with a cactus full of spikes and, and thorns. We're going to talk tonight about responses to failure. Sometimes when we go through situations of life, we, like David and his friends in this chapter, uh, might come to a situation where we realize all of a sudden that we've made a horrible mistake. We've done something wrong. Maybe we didn't even realize it, but we've done something in our life where we've come to a place of deep failure, a place where something has just blown up in our face and, uh, and we're in a disaster zone. And that's what happened to David and his friends here in this chapter. Let's read this portion of scripture and then we'll get into some detail of the study of what God has for us here tonight. Now, starting in verse number one of 1 Samuel 30, it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept, until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. And we're going to uh, drop the story there for now. And uh, if you if you see in the end of verse 8 what God tells David is going to happen, you pretty much know the rest of the story. There's a few details that are interesting. But, I mean, when God tells you something's going to happen, I mean, it's going to happen. So you don't even have to read the rest of the story if you're curious about what happens. But uh, certainly some of the details are interesting for another time. But let's pray and ask God's guidance before we get any farther into our study. Heavenly Father, we have a... A familiar portion of scripture open before us this evening and we want to be able to take some principles from these lives in front of us and learn some of the things from these real people and their real situations of life uh, that will be a help and encouragement mm -hmm. to us as we follow after you in our situations of life please guide and direct us and teach us we pray in jesus name we ask your help amen all right so here we have the uh, situation here of david and his men now uh, we can understand how this was a horrific situation for them, but a little background is helpful for us uh, to understand that this wasn't just a situation where uh, they they just 
you know something had happened and there was it was completely outside of their expectations or control because the reason that they were having this problem they came back to the city of ziklag and the city had been burned and their families and all their possessions had been dragged off as captives by these amalekites but the things that led up to this situation are part of the reason that this was such a problem for david and his men because the thing of this david and his men were in the city of ziklag now ziklag was a city that belonged to the philistines uh, David had been so scared of what Saul was going to do to him that he decided he'd be safer living among the heathen idolatrous Philistines who wanted to destroy Israel. And he went and made peace with them and lived among them. And so David and his men were living in a foreign land. And so that's part of the problem. They had made a compromise and they said, you know what, we're, we're not going to stay in the land of God. We're not going to trust the Lord. Uh, we're going to go to the land of the Philistines and live among the heathen. We're going to live with them. We're going to get along with them. And that's certainly a grave problem. And that's part of it. But also, part of the uh, events leading up to this that may have been contributing to this situation is you'll notice in verse 1 that it was the Amalekites who had invaded Ziklag and, and burned the city and taken their families captive. Well, if you were to look back to chapter 27, you'd find that while David and his men were in Ziklag living amongst the Philistines, uh, they needed some income. And so they decided to go out and fight against some of the uh, enemies of the people of God. And guess who they went and fought against? You might be uh, not too surprised. In chapter 27, verse 8, it says, David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gizrites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old, or the inhabitants of the land, as it goes to show even the land of Egypt. Who was it that they were going and attacking and picking fights with? The Amalekites. And as they did so, guess who came back? to fight against David and his men in the city of Ziklag, the Amalekites. It was them again. And so some of the situation that they came home to, I mean, we can imagine in our own lives, if you came home, your house was burnt down and somebody kidnapped your family, uh, distress beyond distress, heartache on heartache, uh, absolute devastation to their hearts and souls. And that's why we can understand that in verse 4 it tells us that they, they wept until they were without power of weeping anymore. They cried until they had no more ability to cry any longer. And so we can understand that they were in a time of great heartache and great despair, but we can also see that this is partly their own fault. Uh, they shouldn't have been there in the first place, and they shouldn't have been doing some of the things perhaps that they were doing. And so some of their own decisions had led to this disaster. Sometimes we make wrong choices too. Sometimes we fail in our Christian lives. Sometimes. Sometimes it's minor, you know, sometimes it's no big deal, but sometimes it's a big disaster. And sometimes it really comes home to us and it hits our heart to realize we've made a mess of things and things have turned sour and we look at the situation and understand that it's a big mess. And here, that's where David and his men are. And I wanted us to see here in this chapter three different responses to a situation of failure, three different reactions to how they uh, responded to what had happened. And I wanted us to see that sometimes those three reactions can be how we react. The first one that we're going to look at this evening is defiance. Defiance. Because when David and his men came back, obviously they were sorrowful, they were sad, they were upset. But we find in verse number six that the reaction of David's men to the situation was defiance. Their reaction was, let's kill David. <laughs> let's kill David. Basically, their response was, it's not my fault, it's his fault. <laughs> it's their fault. It's that person's fault. But really, each person would have to take their own responsibility for what had happened. None of them was there uh, because they were forced to be there. <laughs> None of them was there because David had twisted their arms or put a sword to their throat and said, you're coming with me to Ziklag. All of these men were there because they chose to be there. And so here they are. They made a bad decision. And it blew up in their face. And so what do they do? Blame David. <laughs> Blame somebody else. Defiance. It's easier at times to blame other people than to take responsibility for our own share and our own failures. Uh, you know what? Sometimes other people contribute to our mistakes. Sometimes people contribute to our failures. But really, it's important for us not to be defiant, but rather to take responsibility for the choices we've made. Uh, other people can contribute, but we need to acknowledge our responsibility for the situation that we're in. Um, years ago, I heard a powerful truth that has helped, I think, so many lives besides mine, and that is this, that God balances guilt with blame. 
when we are willing to take the blame for our actions, God will remove the guilt from our lives. If we say, yes, God, my fault. I, I did it. I made the choice. It's my fault. I acknowledge that. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if we'll say, yes, Lord, that's my fault. I'm, I'm guilty there. Forgive me. Then God will remove the guilt and we'll accept the blame. But these guys, rather than accepting the blame for their own decisions, uh, they were ready to blame somebody else. They were ready to point the finger. They were not willing to accept responsibility for their actions. And uh, in our stubbornness at times, we can respond the same way. When things go wrong, we can say, not my fault. It's not my fault. And, and I don't need to change. There's nothing wrong with me. It's everybody else that's the problem. And that's a very dangerous situation. And countless times I have seen people respond to the situations of life with defiance. I'm not changing. I didn't do anything wrong. I had a good reason. I'm not to blame. It's everybody else that's the problem. And that's a tremendously dangerous way to respond to the situations of life, especially to our own failures. Because you know what? We all do things that we have to acknowledge as our own failures. And yes, other people may have contributed, but blaming them won't help you. That won't fix anything in your life. We need to, to take a different perspective uh, because when we are stubborn about our faults and our failures, stubborn about our weaknesses, ignoring what's, what God's trying to do in our life, uh, we can end up just uh, shutting ourselves off from some of God's best blessings. You know what? God wants to work in your life. God wants to draw you to himself. But the, one of the best ways to shut yourself off from God's goodness is defiance. No, God, I didn't do anything wrong. It's not my fault. I had no choice. Making excuses getting mad at other people, blaming, excusing, and rather than that, rather than responding rightly. I heard a really good sermon recently on a verse in Psalm 34, verse 18, that I thought was, was so clear and helpful in this theme. Uh, it says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And that's the spirit that's the opposite of defiance, is contrite, contrition. It's saying, oh, I was wrong, I'm sorry, Lord. That's the spirit that, that's helpful rather than defiance against God. We shouldn't be defiant. We should be contrite when we've done wrong, when we failed, when we've uh, made the decisions that have blown up in our face. That's the response God's looking for. God is very near those of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Not those who are stubborn and, you know, the Bible uses that phrase, stiff-necked. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever meet people that are stiff-necked? I hope that's none of us. Uh, but sometimes we can get stubborn. Stiff-necked against God, right? Stiff-necked. I just love that word picture because it's so graphic, isn't it? Just, you can picture somebody with a you know, stiff neck against, against God's trying to direct them. Um, God's trying to turn their attention and their focus, and they're just refusing to turn, refusing to yield. And so defiance is that first reaction that sometimes we can come to in the situations of failure in our own lives. Defiance against God and his will for our lives. Defiance against the truth. Defiance against our own acknowledgement of our own responsibility. These people were, first of all, defiant. They refused to respond to their own behavior. All right, so the second thing that we'll see here is despondence. Now, I know despondence isn't exactly a word, but it, it's uh, despondency is the actual word, but I like to change it for the sake of our, I invented a word, I hope that's okay. Uh, despondence is the next response, because as we see the situation, here they're in tremendous difficulty, and God gives them a promise and says, you can go, you can capture, you can have victory, you can, you can, Get everything back. All the people, all your stuff, everything's coming back. He says, thou shalt without fail recover all. And boy, when you read the rest of the story, you find out not only did they get all their family back, they get all their stuff back, they got a bunch of extra stuff back when they won the victory over the Amalekites. So they came home richer than they were when they left, uh, when they left Ziklag and left their families behind. So it, it actually turned out really, really well. But when they were on their journey, we find that some of the people who went to rescue their own families, uh, they ended up with a despondency in their lives as they looked at the situation uh, of hopelessness in their perspective. We read to verse 8, but I wanted to look at verse 9 and 10, and we'll see where these people uh, come to a place of despondence. In verse 9 and 10, it says, So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and the 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook, be sore. Now, 200, or, or one-third of this, this group of soldiers started on the journey, 
but they, they got to the point where they said, we can't keep going. And I think that it was more than just physical fainting. I think it was a spiritual mm. fainting in their heart. I think that they got to the point in the situation where they just, they just gave up hope. They gave up believing that anything could turn out right. They had lost hope and had given up. They got to the point where they said, we can't make it, we can't do it, there's no hope, we've traveled all this way trying to find our families, we made it as far as the Brook Besor, we just can't go any farther. Uh, they faced an obstacle and they gave up. And certainly a lot of us would understand that. We would understand facing a heartache like that and say, wow, I don't know how I would survive either. How I would make it through something so difficult. Basically, they got to the point of saying, why bother? What's the point in trying? We've, we've done so much. We've trusted the Lord. We've done so many things. We've, we've worked. We've labored. We've fought. We, we trusted God. And look where it got us. And so here they are basically saying, why bother? And giving up. It's not worth it. We can't do it. We've tried before. It never works. And that's sometimes the response we come to in our Christian lives when things aren't going right. Sometimes we can come to the point saying, oh, I give up. Why bother? What's the point? It's not even worth trying anymore. And that's the response that these men seem to have had. Uh, they had this, this uh, you know, our modern word, it's not really a Bible word, but we would, we would call them despondent or maybe depressed. <laughs> they sort of gave up. They said, there's no point in trying. It's not worth it. Uh, it's not going to work. And they gave up hope. There's a difference between despondency and despair, uh, but despondency is when hope seems lost uh, to the point where somebody stops trying. They stop trying. And that's where I see these men. They came to an obstacle and they said, it's too much, and they, they weren't willing to try anymore. And that's sometimes a situation we can get into our own lives. We can say, why bother? It's not making any difference. I can't see any change. Nothing's happening the way it should. But the problem is that that's not a situation that's going to get us any farther down the road. Look, the reason we get to a place of despondency is because we want things to be better. But they will never be better if we give up, will they? One of my favorite quotes is from Thomas Edison. He said, most of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And when we give up in the Christian life, we don't realize that we could be on the verge of a miracle. We could be on the very edge of seeing God intervene and work something incredible in our lives uh, that would really make a difference to change our lives for eternity. And if we will turn to God rather than just... To, uh, ending up in despondency, we can see a miracle. And that's what happened in the third reaction. We've seen defiance and despondence, uh, but thirdly, we see dependence. And that's King David. He was anointed king. He wasn't actually on the throne yet, obviously. But David here, uh, rather than defiance and anger and, and frustration against others, rather than it's not my fault and I'm not changing, and, and rather than, oh, well, I just give up. I, there's no point in trying. He turns to God. And in the end of verse 6, it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And you know what? Sometimes you're in a situation of life where nobody else is going to encourage you. Everybody around you might have a bad attitude. Everybody else uh, might have given up. Everybody else might be either defiant or despondent. And, and you can't turn to people for, for somebody to lift you up. Sometimes that's the situation of life. Sometimes you're all on your own. But you can always encourage yourself by turning to the Lord and depending on God. And that's what David did. He encouraged himself in the Lord as God. And there's several key things that we find here. First of all, he, he connected with the priest. He, he called Abiathar the priest and sought some help. And certainly there are spiritual people in our lives that will be an encouragement and a help to us uh, that will be a blessing in those times when we're struggling. And maybe everybody else around us has given up hope or given up their walk with God. And people can be an encouragement to us. Look to those spiritual ones who are a strength and an encourager and a blessing to you. Those who are walking with the Lord and have a connection to God, they can be a blessing to lift you up and carry you through those tough times. And so David was depending upon the people around him who were a help and a blessing. He looked to somebody like Abiathar, who was able to be a help to him in his time of need in a spiritual way. Not just looking for um, physical help, but spiritual help as well. So he connected with a spiritual helper. He also sought revelation and truth from the Lord. He sought a message from the Lord. Now we don't have, a, he went to, a, he said, bring me hither the ephod and he inquired of the Lord. We don't have the same methods of communicating with God that David had. 
but we've got prayer still and we've got the bible and we can seek communication with god we can talk to the lord we can seek after god and say lord help me uh, lord i need your intervention in my life and so he called out to god and sought the lord and sought god's truth for his life and God gave him a message. And you know what? God doesn't speak to us in the same way that God spoke to David. Uh, but God has spoken to us through the powerful word of God that we have in our hands today. God's word will give you direction. God's word will give you the answers in those times of struggle. That when you face defeat, when you've come to, the, the, to rock bottom, you've, you've spent your last dollar and you don't know where to turn, you can turn to the Lord and you can find strength in God. And God is there for you to meet your need and to answer the hurt of your heart. God's word is full of answers for hurting hearts. Uh, God, as we saw already, is near to those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. He is ready to reach into the lives of those who lean upon him the most. The more we draw close to God, the more he will draw close to us. And so though David's hurt was as deep as any of these others, certainly he had lost just as much as they had, his response to this failure and disaster in his life was completely different and took a completely different direction. David's response, rather than defiance or despondency, was to respond with a dependence upon God. He, he sought God's servant, he sought God's word, he sought truth from the Lord, and he depended upon God to do a miracle. Now, it was going to take a miracle uh, to see God's promise here fulfilled. It was going to take a miracle for them to chase after these Malachites and get everything back. Uh, that's miraculous. You don't hear about this in any other situation of life. It doesn't work like that. When somebody comes and kidnaps your family, attacks and burns your city, steals your family, steals all your stuff, you don't get everything back. It doesn't work like that. That takes a miracle. And here's David saying, I'm going to step up by faith because God has given me direction through his message, and I'm going to believe God for a miracle. And that's what you and I can do today. We can believe God's word for miracles. We can follow the truth of the word of God, and rather than getting frustrated or rather than getting discouraged and downhearted and despondent, we can stand in dependence of God. We can lean upon the Lord and step out by faith and really just believe that what God has said, you know what, he will do. God will keep his word and God will keep his promises. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to people around us. And sometimes they're all just, you know, having a hissy fit for one direction or the other. And, and we can go through the situations of life and, and find God's grace. These first two reactions, defiance and despondence, kind of remind me of what the psalmist writes in Psalm 42. Uh, why art thou uh, cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? <laughs> cast down and disquieted. Uh, that, that seems like a, a contradiction, doesn't it? Uh, one, one moment he's despondent, and the next moment he's, he's stirred up and, and in turmoil. And people all around us might be either stirred up in turmoil and frantic and angry and upset and just blowing up and other people might be in the depths of despair you know living in this deep despondency of there's no point in trying but we who seek after god and live in the dependence that god has for our lives not only can we come to a place of miracles and a place of victory but we can teach and lead others to that same place of miracles and victory as well david was the one who as a leader sought after the lord trusted in god and he was able to bring people behind him to a place of victory to a place of miracles and yes they traveled through this this wilderness chasing after the army that invaded and yes they found them and yes they had victory and they were able to recover everything when when they came to the situation the first group of people we saw were defiant they were looking out. They were looking at everybody else. They were looking outwardly. The second group of people who were despondent, they were looking down, sort of downhearted, depressed, looking down at the ground and just defeated. But rather than looking out at others or looking down in discouragement, David looked up and he saw the Lord. He looked up to his Father in heaven, to the God of Israel, and he saw what God alone could do in a situation that was beyond earthly hope. And so also we can look to Jesus. We can look to heaven when we need our lives transformed, when we've come to a place of failure, when things have blown up in our face, rather than looking at everybody else, rather than just looking down in discouragement and frustration, we can look to heaven. We can look unto Jesus, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who is able to give us strength, able to give us victory, able to give us opportunity to triumph in the midst of the most heartbreaking situations. And that's where David and his friends were. The most heartbreaking situation, perhaps, of their entire lives. David found God's grace. 
It reminds me also of Peter when he was walking on water and all of a sudden things started going south. <laughs> He was, he was afraid because he saw the wind and he saw the waves and he saw the sea and he was afraid and started to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. But when he got his eyes back on Jesus and said, Lord, save me, Jesus was there and he was ready to pull him out of the water and help him walk on water again. You know what? Jesus has promised us he'll always be there when we need him. Sometimes we wander from him, but he never wanders from us. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For though he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know what? God will always be there for us when we need him. <coughs> sometimes we've gotten far from him, and sometimes it takes us a little while to get back to where we need to be in our lives. But God is always there. He has never left us. He has never forsaken us. He has never disappointed us or let us down. He is always faithful. He cannot deny himself. Another encouraging verse that I think is so helpful for us is Psalm 55 and verse 22. He says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Uh, when we are following God, when we're living righteous and doing God's will, uh, we're living for the Lord. He will keep us. He'll preserve us from danger and disaster. He will keep us from being destroyed. Uh, those who are following after God, we can cast our burdens on him and he will sustain us. He will carry us through. He will lift us up. He will give us grace and strength in the life's darkest hours. And so when we come to those times, maybe it's a situation of failure. Maybe it's a situation of defeat in our own lives, in a spiritual situation where temptation has overcome us, where we've made the wrong choices, we've made some wrong decisions, we've followed the wrong path, taken bad advice. You know what? Whatever situation we come to where things have gone wrong, we have these choices. How are we going to respond? Will it be defiance? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm okay. I'm not changing. It's everybody else's fault. Anger, defiance. Or will it be despondence? Oh, I give up. There's no point. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to church anymore. I give up. I'm not reading my Bible anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm going to quit soul winning. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stand up like that anymore. I just get blown out every single time. Despondence. Or will it be dependence? God, what a mess. Help me. Cleanse me, use me, forgive me, walk with me, show me your path, I'll follow you, I'll trust you. That is the only path out of that valley that will lead to victory. Don't stay in those valleys of defeat. Trust in the Lord and he will sustain you. Cast your burden upon him. Give your, your weights and your struggles to the Lord and trust in him. He will carry you through. Trust in God, he will lift you up. Let's pray as we close our study tonight. Heavenly Father, we certainly each need your word to speak to our hearts tonight. I pray you'd help us to see the power of what David went through. In our own lives, sometimes we face those struggles and heartaches. I pray that you'd help us to respond with dependence upon you, leaning upon you for strength, understanding our own inability, realizing that trusting in our own strength will always lead to defeat. Help us, Lord, to lean upon you today, to trust in you, to stand in your strength, and to see what you alone could do through our lives to bring victory and to bring restoration to the disasters that we may have experienced. Father, give us grace and direction as we prepare to close this study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>